Listen, listen, the music lies in silence. Show me, show me your way. Walk in stillness, your steps leaving no traces. Speak without words as you say. Where we have no thought, where beauty lies in silence, there lies a man of the ways. Trevor Price Leggett, TP, was perhaps the most influential Englishman in the development of judo in the UK, and when invited to the Kodokan, the birthplace of judo, in 1939, progressed to become the highest non-Japanese grade in the world. But TP was so much more than a martial arts or judo personality. He would say, Our judo must give us qualities which we can use in our daily life. The judo principle of efficiency teaches us to challenge our limitations. A fluent linguist, he was enlisted by British intelligence in the Second World War. He served as head to the BBC Japanese service, became chess and shogi master, and was a devout follower of Zen and yoga philosophy. Leggett's achievements did not come easily, but Trevor firmly believed that throughout our lives we must, like Robert the Bruce's spider, constantly challenge the limitations imposed upon us by others. He was able to see past the limitations. He somehow knew what was in people. And what was in people was what I suppose people used to call the soul. He could see the soul. The story of his friend, Yasuhara Oyama, and his struggles holds many parallels with Trevor's own life. Oyama, chess champion whom I knew well in Japan, when he was a small boy, he got the idea he wanted to play. And he went to a dojo in Osaka, and they gave him a few test games. And the uh, head teacher, a man of enormous experience who trained champions, he said, my boy, you haven't got the talent. To take you on wouldn't be honest. It wouldn't be fair to you. I'm not taking you on with you. Well, he wept. And then the teacher said, look, after school you can come here and you can clean up as a servant and you can watch the game and play occasionally. But I'm not taking you on as a pupil. Well, Oyama became a champion at least ten times and dominated the Japanese chess. He won a hundred major competitions. If he'd accepted that decision on the limitation, he would have failed. Like Oyama, Trevor was at first discouraged from taking up his chosen activity and at the age of 16, he secretly attended the Budokai as a junior, spurred on by the dual wish to build up his stamina damaged by sedentary years of music practice and ill health, and to combat his feelings of having been bullied at school. His father, himself a gifted violinist at the London Philharmonic Orchestra, had encouraged Leggett to become an accomplished classical pianist of professional standard and strongly disapproved of his son, being involved in martial arts. He eventually relented after being impressed by Tani's Albert Hall show and was amazed to discover that his son could perform similar moves. My father saw Tani when he came to the West. He's very impressed with him. Tani appears in one of Bernard Shaw's early plays, Major Barbara, marvelously defeating a huge wrestler. My father saw this. When he finally found out that I was doing judo, he said, what's he teaching? So I showed him some of the things. He said, well, no, it's not the real stuff. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've seen him beat a huge man. He must have touched some nerve center to paralyze. He could never throw that big man. Leggett was admitted as a full member of the Budokai in 1933, when Jigoro Kanu, the father of judo, visited the club founded in 1918 by his disciple, Gunji Koizumi, Leggett's first teacher. In 1939, he went to Japan himself, studying at the Kodokan and attaining sixth dan, the highest grade ever awarded to a gaijin foreigner. Leggett studied judo with the intensity and commitment which he applied to every field of his life, becoming an accomplished judoka, revered teacher, and the author of many books on technique. His classes were legendary, with Sundays by invitation only, and were the toughest around. In fact, at one stage, Leggett founded a new club, the Renshudan, since he felt that the Budokai had gone soft. A frequently told story was of the young Leggett feeling distinctly ill one night, turned away from practice, only to be stopped by the diminutive 
but intensely fierce Yuki Otani, who inquired what he would do if faced with an assailant with a hammer. Would you tell him to come back and attack you tomorrow when you felt no. better, Legit son? No. Naturally, the conscientious Legit returned to practice. Despite acquiring superb fitness through intense training, his health was not good and a congenital arterial problem resulted in a stroke in 1946. He made an excellent recovery and although his doctors forbade further judo, he returned to teaching within a year. In his books, he often talks about a man in his 30s who has a stroke in his whole career, which he, he, he expected to happen as being destroyed, and he finds his way through to another one when he, he becomes an author. But of course, that was based on Trevor's experience of his stroke, which ended many things, but then started others, and he started writing his books and things. And he said, looking back on it, I approve of that stroke. Would I ever have tamed the wild horses if that stroke hadn't come along? Whilst attaining the title of Sheehan, an eventual grade of Ninth Dan, Leggett did not believe in glorifying title and grade level. Skill was more important than the colour of one's belt, and there was no shame in becoming a beginner again. He would refer to beginner's mind as a state in which one could humbly look at a situation afresh free from prejudice and preconceived ideas. He believed in judo for life and applied the same philosophy derived from yoga and Zen to his physical practice, drawing out the best in his pupils and encouraging them to better themselves. This book led me to understand spiritual training. A man so trained can be calm in any situation and that's where it came in that the training was essential to be educated and since I had not much education when I started, still haven't got a lot, uh, I got a lot of value from it. In judo you need mental muscle and you need skillful living. Now, now they're, not, they're not judo terms, they are Buddhist terms but they apply because Trevor's used them terms in different metaphors. Everything has to be uh, sanctioned mentally to be learned. So it's done then without thinking. In practical terms, it says Trevor, when you learn something, it's learned and it's repeated and it's repeated. And when it becomes natural, there's a calmness in that movement. It's a spiritual endeavour. In 1964, Leggett abruptly stopped teaching judo, having decided he had done enough in this sphere. But he continued to write and to lecture. In later life, he was dismayed by the direction judo had taken, seeing it as a chase for medals. Despite having devoted so much of his life to judo, he believed in letting go and moving on. We have to learn, hold tightly, let go lightly. Now, I may hold like mad, but sooner or later, the pain is going to be too bad. Then I'm cooled off down. If we are holding, and he slowly gets out. I hold on and on and on, and it goes and goes. To hold tightly, then when I realize it's gone, instead of holding on, let go and retain the balance. We must apply this in life. Try something very hard, put all we have into it, and then it begins to go. No, no, hold on. Don't go, don't go. And then we're left longing and regretting. Judo can teach us that. Find these applications to your daily life. It is my life. Judo, you've got something spiritually that can help you to continue living. A happy life. It gave me, it gave me harmony. And harmony is balance. Judo discipline is doing things that you dislike doing. It is also doing things that you fear doing. That's discipline. And then you get back then to Trevor again because he pops up here and he says, well, you've got a dragon mask on it because you feared it. If you take the dragon mask off, it's not as bad as you thought it was. When we fall, we learn the first thing is to fall with the whole body. We try and keep off the ground. Oh, no, 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 no. In the same way when we have a failure in life, to use our judo practice and completely take that faith. His affinity with Zen philosophy had early beginnings when at the age of four he surprised his mother by making plasticine models of the Buddha, which he treated with reverence. By the age of 14 he had begun meditating and as a young man of 23 he met his most influential teacher, Dr. Hari Prasad Shastri, to whom he devoted most of his spiritual achievements 
for the rest of his life. Trevor's spiritual path was laid down in 1855 when a guru invited a group of young men and women to what proved to be a very auspicious meeting in a tiny little village high up in the Himalayas. At that time, the guru prophesied that the teachings would be brought to England and he said, a branch of the Holy Ganges will flow to Angladesha, England. One of the young men at that meeting turned out to be the guru of Dr. Shastri's guru and it was Dr. Shastri who fulfilled the prophecy by bringing the teachings to England and he acquired as a pupil Trevor Leggett. Trevor used to always say that he had all his Zen knowledge from Dr. Shastri, but he was a very skeptical individual and while he was in Japan he checked out every single detail of what Dr. Shastri had told him. Leggett studied and became fluent in Japanese and entered the Rinzai Zen temple of Enkakuji in Kamakura. When seeking admission, a disciple must sit in meditation pose outside the gate and wait to be called forward. Leggett sat for many hours outside the famous gate of Enkakuji, realising that he was being secretly watched and that if he moved, he would not be found worthy of admission. When he was eventually called forward, he had to be lifted by the monks since his legs were temporarily paralysed and could not support him any longer. Kamakura was famed for the samurai on the moment, one word, Kamakura Zen or Warrior Zen, aimed to provide short lessons as koans or riddles, often in the form of a poem based on incidents from everyday life, a spilt teacup, a cloth, water, to guide the samurai pupils who destined to die for their lord or shogun might have little time to reach Zen realization and little time to live. Tokimuni, regent of Japan in the 13th century, founded the temple of Enkakuji after his defeat of the Mongols and took the name from an ancient mirror inscribed Enkaku, perfect realization, which was unearthed on the site. Several koans were based on this event, with the perfect mirror being allied to the soul. Those who would enter the gate of Enkakuji were asked, what is the gate through which all Buddhas enter the world? Leggett's book, The Warrior Cones, or Samurai Zen, brought together 100 rare riddles which had been guarded with reverent secrecy in Japan's Kamakura temples since the 13th century. Representing the core spiritual discipline of ancient samurai tradition, they reflected the earliest manifestation of pure Zen in Japan. The shadow of the bamboo sweeps the steps, but the dust does not stir. The moon's disk pours into the lake, but the water shows no scar. The flower bucket took the stream water and held it, and the reflection of the moon through the pines lodged there in purity. Enabling a widening of consciousness beyond the illusions of the limited self and a joyful inspiration in life, study of the koans induces a state which has been compared to being free under a blue sky after imprisonment. Leggett remained principally devoted to Adiyatma Yoga and would attend devotions on a nightly basis, often running the three miles from the Budokai after an intense judo session so as not to be late. When I think of Trevor talking about yoga, very often the phrase that comes to my mind is it has to be something which you can put your weight on. So he would say you need to practice and when times are favourable. And then, when problems come along, you experience fear or temptation or disappointment, then there can be some strength. Trevor was a polymath and he was devoted to learning and self-improvement. He never thought it was too late to learn something new. And even on his deathbed, he was translating Sanskrit verses. If Trevor ever asked you to do something, the biggest mistake was to say, oh, I'm not very good at that. Because the answer would always be, well, get good at it. As we become experts in our field of life, we become like a powerful bull with great horns as symbols of our mastery. But the bull with wide horns cannot pass through the gate to new pastures. To widen our field of knowledge, we must heed the teacher who tells us, you've mastered that technique. 
Now give it up for six months and try something new. Now many of us fail this test. We think, what? I'll look an absolute fool. No, I'm not going to do this. And we stick with what we know. We are reluctant to try new skills, lest we should fail. We become the bull, reliant on his horns. We are blocked from progressing. But those who have faith in the teacher, and who realise the teacher has faith in them, will follow his advice and give up their faith in technique for a while. They begin to develop a freedom of thought and movement. When opportunities arise, they are ready to profit from them, because their minds are not fixed on one technique or one situation. Suddenly, we are asked to cut our horns off, and that means becoming a beginner again. This is a very important side of the spiritual, as well as the technical aspects of training. When we've mastered something, we should take up something else, where we're going to be no good at all. If you're a violinist and you've mastered the violin, then take up the piano and you'll be stumbling over five finger exercises. When you've become a great big frog in your own pond and you're puffing yourself up, go to the neighbouring pond and become a tadpole, a tiny little tadpole. This is again cutting off the bull's horns and being able to go freely into other forms. Like the ancient teachers of the samurai, Leggett used analogies from the martial arts in helping his students to achieve Zen meditation free of intrusive thoughts. When we do this practice, if an external sound comes, it shifts our concentration, but then we come back to it. When we practice the judo, we learn balance by being pushed, and then we recover balance. And it's by being pushed that your body learns balance, it recovers it immediately. Now, in the same way, we can treat this practice, say there's a sudden sound or there's a sudden memory, troubling memory comes up. Not to think, oh, I've lost concentration. No, think of this as a push. Now I come back. In this way, bringing the attention back to the central point, we practice the inner balance. Still point, even Shakespeare in the sonnets, 51, in wing speed, no motion shall I know. In judo term, in the martial arts, the ego is, is destroyed. So there is no spirit and there is no self. There is no thinker behind the thought. What you want and what you crave for will not come. It comes of its own free will, its own volition. During Zen practice, Leggett would add a physical dimension of reaching for the stars pushing out the walls, pushing heaven and earth apart, or animal motions, such as the lion's growl, which acquired a depth of power derived from the tandem, or the yoga concept of a horse shedding hair. For a moment, we are to try to shake off the world and its concerns like those loose hairs. When this has been practised daily for a good time, unexpectedly before a critical moment, a conviction comes welling up from the Atman self beyond the mind. Let it happen. Let anything happen. I am free of it all. Then the horse goes forward confidently into the arena, its rider in deep joy. At outbreak of World War II, Leggett was attached to the British Embassy in Tokyo and was interned in 1941. Conditions were hard, but TP managed to keep himself fit by practicing judo with his guards. In July 1942, the embassy staff were transferred to the former passenger ship Tatsuta Maru in Yokohama Harbor and began a month's journey to Mozambique where British personnel were exchanged for Japanese diplomats from England, Australia and India. During their passage, Leggett amused himself with his guards whom he noticed would pick up every piece of paper in the waste baskets to analyse each day in case their charges were spies. Leggett acquired the habit of walking round the deck each morning, during which time he would write himself a little note or joke and slowly tear it into dozens of pieces and throw them over his shoulder as he walked. He laughed inwardly as he saw his captors scurry behind him picking up all the little pieces to reconstruct his secret messages. On his return to London, he joined the Ministry of Information and was posted to India until the end of the war. His time at the BBC began in 1946, where he eventually became head of the BBC's Japanese section until his retirement in 1969. 
Dr. Shastri, appreciating the depth of Trevor's spirituality, advised him that he should take the vow of Brahmacharya, the way to the absolute. Part of that vow involves celibacy, but it also involves sacrifice after sacrifice in search of ultimate knowledge, then using that knowledge to help others, which Trevor did all the time. But he never fooled himself into thinking that people would be grateful for the help that he gave. In fact, he realised that often they would resent it. And so he always said to me, help and run. When we are frightened, when we are shivering with fear, there is something within us which is not shivering. When we are blazing with anger, there is something within us which is not angry. When we are upset by something, no, there is something within us which is independent can't be touched. When there's a torrent of abuse, there's something within which is not touched by the torrent. Have experience of that separate self first in meditation and revive the awareness of it in daily life. Trevor Leggett published over 30 books and continued to write to the end of his life despite advanced age, failing health and blindness. The last book to be published in his lifetime was The Old Zen Master in which he speaks of robes of honour. In judo, there is a certain grading contest called one against ten. You have to take on ten men, one after the other. They are generally a couple of grades below you, and with luck are so terrified of you that it is easy to dispose of them. But one or two of them think, everybody knows I'm going to lose anyway, so I've got nothing to lose. And they come shooting at you, taking fantastic risks. Because you are so sure of your own superiority, which he doesn't seem to recognise, and because he comes straight at you, whoosh, you can't get the robes of self-conceit and assurance off in time, so that once in a blue moon, he scores. Then you know what it's like to look an utter fool. This happened to some rather famous contest men who were not fully alert because they felt it was unnecessary. They had already put on the robes of their coming victory no longer simply the judo champions they ought to be, they became judo champions in cumbersome robes of honour. In these ways, we put robes of honour on ourselves and they hamper us and we can't do the job properly. Leggett died of a stroke in the early morning on the 2nd of August 2000 and at his funeral, the best epitaph there could be was a passage from his last book, The Old Zen Master. We can learn a lot of other things from music. You do not hang on to a chord, no matter how beautiful. You do not regret the end of a piece of music. The piece is played and comes to a natural end. In the same way, a life is played. He would say that one may fear dying, but that at the moment of death a doorway opens, and as the dying looks through, there is a smile. At last, one can rejoice in wearing new robes. Though the leaves may fall and the music ends, still the sun will rise once more. Though we may grow old and we lose it all, yet we'll have 